Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCG live codes, make sure you check out the Poe Town store. You can get a 5% discount on your orders using that code OmniPoke. For today's video, I'm going to be going over my Twilight Masquerade tier list. Uh, obviously the NAIC is just next week. I'm hoping to get as many videos out as possible, but obviously I'm away from home right now. I'm in Bologna for the special event and then I'm flying straight out to uh, New Orleans, so I'm hoping I can get some hotel setups rolling and get as many videos out still as possible. Uh, so, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm hoping at the very least things can work out okay. Uh, but we have a handful of decks. I'm going to fly through some of the low tier stuff just to get it on the board, just to say like set the scene of like why they're not doing that great probably uh, and then we'll move on to the higher tier stuff and hopefully in a bit more detail. So uh, I'm going to start off with some of my lowest tier stuff. Uh, I'm going to put Blissey into the D tier. It showed promise uh, when it was like this counter archetype to Dragapult, but it feels like the format is too wide and too versatile. So even though Blissey can boast a decent time into the Dragapults, it's like reasonable sometimes into Gardevoir. It's very, very bad into Raging Bolt Ogapon, which has been the most popular deck in online tournaments. So um, I feel like having such a high profile bad matchup, also not being great into Lugia and other one hit KO archetypes, um, you will struggle. And even if there are going to be some Dragapult lists that play Charizard, that matchup becomes a lot worse for you as well so essentially there's just too much one hit ko for the sort of mid-range um tanky archetype right now also it's not the highest consistency build it's quite reliant on like arvin tm turbo energize and these are fast aggressive archetypes that can just punch straight away like the maridons and the raging bolts and they can also like punish the bliss as well so yeah i think this is going to hang out in d tier i'm also going to drop like arceus decks in general to the sort of the top of the d tier it at least has consistency on its side and it can play decent hand disruptors we've seen even some control east style builds of arceus that include like radzard and some hand disruption options and whatnot so i think that's like fair valid but i do think that v stars in general are getting pretty well hunted by uh, raging bolt and maridon as the aggressive like pace setting decks in the metagame raging bolt specifically a problem for arceus because it can't get through with max belt to like respond on the raging bolts so uh yes you can go up in like counter catches and whatnot and still you need to like hunt for ogre and you need damage mods there as well so yeah i think that matchup is like pretty woeful and the selling points of arceus aren't that high like you're good into like controlling matchups and yes you can be disruptive to some of these other decks but Raging Bolt, Maridon will like race you pretty aggressively. Lugia is still a difficult like beat stick deck. So there really just aren't any selling points to Arceus outside of like, yeah, you can get your V-Star power and be a fairly consistent archetype. Counterpoint to that, I'm going to put uh, Gouging Fire in the D tier as well. I feel like it's just, its job is done better by Raging Bolt and Maridon, to be honest with you. The only upside of Gouging Fire is that you get to play Radiant Charizard, and that's like an upside. Uh, but you are just far less consistent of an aggressive deck than the ones uh, that we'll put higher on the tier list. So there's essentially just better ways to play this strategy uh, on the tier list. And finally, I am going to put it into the C tier, but I do think the Iron Thorns deck, even though it has had a couple of like spikes in online tournaments, I feel like the metagame again is kind of too wide for an archetype like this that's really just trying to punish like Lugia as your best matchup. Also, you can be a headache to the Raging Bolt Ogre Pond decks because they are so ability reliant for a lot of their draw and obviously their acceleration as well. Um, so you're a headache to a couple high profile decks, but I think against everything else, you're just like a really, really low power cheese deck. And again, you're inconsistent as well. So I'm going to put this at the C tier at best. It's also going to join its other future mons in I'm going to put future hands in C tier as well probably Yuho Kalama is going to go deep in the tournament with this archetype but I don't think the masses are certainly going to play this there aren't many selling points to the deck um, I feel like again Maridon and Raging Bolt Ogapon are like better aggressive archetypes obviously the upside of Iron Hands is that you're a more aggressive deck into the one prize archetypes like the Dragapults and the Gardevoir specifically I feel like you can have a decent time but the way the deck is, is constructed you're typically taking a one prize KO with Maridon early anyway there's even more counts catcher in the format I feel in a lot of these stage two decks I'm up to two counts in a lot of these lists partially because of the uptick in Lugia but also those cards are really good into Raging Bot as well when they have big bravery charmed Pokemon to get through so having multiple copies of Countercatcher in these deck lists make life more awkward for future hands where it's going to be so much easier for these sort of setup decks to take a 2-2-2 prize map and essentially ignore Maridon for the entire game so yeah I think the selling points of future hands again is just on the low right now and then we'll have sort of our first fall from grace going to be the Chem Pow Bats Calibur it was already like teetering on consistency issues for such a high 
tier archetype, but it was basically being propelled by the amount of Charizard that was just generally in the field. So you basically got free wins as long as you set up in the format in Temporal Forces, and that's going to be much less the case. Even if Charizard is going to remain like at 10%, it's just going to have lost a lot of percentage into other matchups, specifically things like Dragapult, which I think are far more awkward. They're going to force you to play 70 hit points evolving Pokemon, which just ruins your consistency. Having two retreat cost on Bidoof and the Frigi is just such a pain for you. So yeah, I think the selling points of Chen is just like way less now. Your consistency is less and it was not that high to begin with. And again, like Raging Bolt and Maridon are really fast, aggressive options uh, that will also be punishing like a lower amount of consistency that you have in your deck list. And honestly, similar to what I was saying with Gouging Fire, is like there's things that can do it better. I actually think Lugia now, especially with Iron Hands being so easy to use, does what Chen Pao wants to do a lot better. It has one hit co options from a single prize Pokemon. It has Iron Hands to punish the single prize basic attacking decks. And it can, if it wants to, also have the snipe pressure of Wellspring. So I think if you're really looking to play Pao, I think Lugia essentially does it better in this format going ahead. Now let's go to the higher end of the tier list. We're going to put Raging Bot Ogre Pond very high. Uh, we think even though the masses are playing it, it and it seems like people are taking notice and incorporating single prize attacking Pokemon. I think the sort of real world attributes of Raging Bot Ogre Pond are really important. That is to say, it's a very easy to play aggressive archetype that has a ton of draw power. So your consistency is through the roof and you'll be able to play best of 350 minutes every single time. And when you're the most consistent deck playing best of 350 minutes, it's a really, really good thing, I think. So even if your matchups on paper are like middling, just the fact that you are going second in a number of these matchups and just punching the thing in front of you is huge. I think it's going to be massive, certainly into all the V-Star matchups. Like, Dialga gets hurt by this. Lugia is still going to be insane, but it's not enjoying this. Reggie Drago doesn't like this. Obviously, I've already talked about Arceus and how it's falling off the map because of this. Essentially, anything where you see a two prizes straight away, you're going to be just pouncing on that immediately, and it's insane. I think one of the only weaknesses of Raging Bolt Ogre Pond is that you don't really have a very good single prize attacking threat, and you don't have, like, an Iron Hands option in the list either. But I feel like it doesn't matter all that much it's very often that you'll get three prizes up on a lot of these setup archetypes because so many of them require like rotom forest and that sort of thing and it gives your opponent a very specific window to get the job done and certainly my raging bolt ogre pond plays iono in the mix as well so these decks like gardevoir and dragapult and sometimes even charizard that are trying to accumulate in a massive big combo to like make a comeback on you you can try and deny that with those ionos in the sort of mid to late game when you've already flooded the board of like 10 energy or something like that so ruthlessly consistent very very strong archetype I am putting it very high, even though I know that there are going to be the Radzards teched into Dragapults, uh, the Lost Zone box builds as well in the format. These are the best ways to deal with Raging Bolts, uh, but I feel like you're still a pretty well-reaching deck that sort of just beats people by getting on the board fast and aggressively and pouncing on any weak hand your opponent has, and I think there's been value to that in the last few formats, and I think this does it really, really well. Another final note is that it might be pushing Maridon a little bit down the tier list because it's also got a pretty nice matchup there. We're going to put Charizard Pidgeot in the A tier. Uh, I think it's getting a little bit warm thin. You lose a lot of ground into the Lugia matchup, which is a shame because they just get so much stronger and have more prize taking options against you, which is trouble. You're also sometimes having to tech for Raging Bot Ogre Pond if they're going to play the Cornerstone Mask EX. Like either you're playing a tech or you're not, and that will immediately choose if you win or lose uh, with Charizard Pidgeot. Ultimately, I feel like we've got to a point where the Pidgeot control deck can spread itself over a better range of matchups than Charizard Pidgeot can. As we've seen, it's been so tough to have like protection for like devolution packages, sometimes having it in your own deck list, protecting against control. Now you have to incorporate Silo to help with Lugia. You also have to have an answer to Raging Bolt. I think the standard Charizard Pidgeot lists are just wearing themselves too thin. Possibly they almost have to take a leaf out of the control Pidgeot book and go like thin Charizard, maybe 313 just to commit spaces to to having like enough tech cards for all these matchups but I think just in general the consistency of Charizard Pidgeot also is taking a big hit also the fact that you can't really use Cleffa as easily either is low-key kind of a big deal you get punished a little bit too much by the Dragapults and of course Gardevoir playing Monkey Dory as well sometimes even the Lost Box decks because you certainly don't have the space for Jirachi in your 60s so yeah Cleffa is like a far less usable card in this format and that's also hurting the Charizard Pidgeot engine that was established with all those negative points I don't think you fall completely off the radar there are still selling points you you are still going to be decent into the Maridon matchup. You still certainly have a game plan into Raining Bot Ogre Pond. And if you do choose to play a tech card for Cornerstone, you immediately win that matchup, which is nice. I think ultimately with Dragapult coming out, it's just too volatile of a format for this to be the best choice in the format. But I still feel it has like such inherent strengths. And as we know, the Barrel Pidgeot means you can sculpt some insane turns. And Charizard always comes on well in the late game with 
high damage output, high hit points, and disruption, and even Radzard weaved in as well. So it's not like a horrible deck by any means, not even close, but it's just a far less easy sell now. I'm also going to be putting Lugia in the highest tier. Uh, I think it's a little bit below Raging but Ogre Pond, uh, but I think it still makes it to the top tier right now, definitely in my top five decks. Uh, Lugia is, you know, when it gets to summon, it is the most insane deck now. The fact that Iron Hands is just so easily splashable, the fact that you can remove Luminion and actually have genuine single prize board states towards the sort of mid to late game once Lugia has been finished off, the fact that you can have Mist protecting all of your Pokemon against Dragapult damage for the majority of the game, the fact that you have Gift Energy also chipping in, like Lugia's got to this point where it has to be respected because that legacy energy effect, if it procs, is just disgusting. The fact that you can have a Minchino being a single prize Pokemon or Iron Hands taking two then giving up one these things are just inherently so disgusting that there's no doubt there's going to be lots of temple of Sinnoh and enhanced hammer in the format if people weren't taking those cards they would essentially have no chance into lugia in the first place the only thing holding me back from lugia taking like a higher spot in my top tier is that its consistency is still a little bit awkward and that does make me worried in best of 350 minutes that said one of the things inherently propping up lugia right now is how much i respect control and you're naturally very capable at taking on control without taking anything in the list so that's another big bonus for Lugia is that you don't have the headache of having to like over tech your list and like remove consistency cards to just inherently beat uh, otherwise really high tier matchup. Let's touch on control. I mentioned it during the Charizard part, but I do think Pidgeot control, as we've seen through Temporal Forces, can spread itself so thin that you can have answers to like so many matchups right now. The fact that Lugia's upticking is obviously a concern for you because that's still a high profile, like awkward matchup. And you don't love seeing like Dragapult, Lost Zone Box, and even just regular Lost Zone Box in the mix. Uh, but I think in general, your matchup spread is really, really solid. It gains some pretty nice tools from the set as well. Uh, we are adding in the Copium Great Tusk to deal with Lugia at times to help deal with the Minchinos. And obviously, if you play Defiance, you can get through Chinchino as well. Uh, it's still a difficult matchup, no doubt. And you are going to be sacking prizes, but you take a more sort of aggressive stance. I think that matchup is still one that needs to be solved. But I think otherwise, Pidgeot with these new tools of Wellspring and Blood Moon being amazing targets to bank your hit point buff tools on and swing games towards the late game with hand disruptors the fact that we had some really high profile pilots of this deck makes me think that taking all those experiences with pidgeot control and playing it at such a high standard and making those tweaks towards twilight masquerade is really tempting as well so i think there's going to be players who haven't tested against the new list enough going into naic so also people can just be walking into all the traps you can lay for them with pidgeot control i think it's a really really good choice going into the event especially because there are so many people who even with the amount of respect we're giving Luke probably won't play it themselves because it's inherently like a risky deck for the last tournament of the season <laughs> because its consistency is a little bit shambolic so i don't know it's it's a weird one pidgeot does have a high profile dodge matchup but i think in general it's really really safe and as long as you pilot it well with all these options i think you get over the line a good amount of the time with the top end starting to flesh out i'm also just going to throw a couple more towards the sort of lower echelons we're going to put greninja towards the lower stages i think still the best way to play it is alongside frostlass and that damage counter placement can be dangerous especially with Devo packages, but I think you also have some like really high profile bad matchups, and I think Raging Bot Ogre Pond is certainly among them, and that's a bit of an issue. I thought at one point Greninja would have a really interesting like niche in the meta if there was like enough Blissey and enough Maridon, but I think those selling point matchups aren't really there enough in the format for Greninja. And again, you're one of the more setup based low consistency archetypes compared to some of the other stage twos you can be playing in the format. So yeah, we're gonna put this towards the bottom of the C tier. I just hadn't seen that one at the time. Uh, I'm actually gonna put Ancient Box towards the sort of top of the C tier here i think i might put it bottom of b actually i think this is yeah i'm gonna put it bottom of b i think it's an underplayed archetype right now because it literally gains no new cards but i think its positioning is kind of interesting where you're happy to see like less charizard i think especially tankier zards with all the healing cards and i think you are slightly worried about the amount of like churro and scoop up cyclone in archetypes generally but i think you like the fact that raging bot and lugia have lower hit point thresholds to sort of deal with even if you're not initiating you sort of have the time to be that one prize deck and make that catch up which I think is a big deal. I think Dragapult isn't necessarily like horrific for you, uh, although you might need to play some additional tech like switch carts in the deck list. I think that alone is enough with the amount of raw hit points all of your ancient mons have and the fact that you can also boost a capsule up as well and Dragapult is likely only playing like one or zero vacuum as well so you can actually make those hit point buffs count. And of course you don't really mind that Gardevoir is a churro deck because they're going to have dark weakness as well so whenever there is an EX on the board you can be capitalizing on those as well. Overall I think uh, Ancient Box in B tier because it's going to be underrepresented I think going into the tournament 
but it's definitely not a bad choice. I'm also going to pop Miraidon in B. It obviously did really well in Japan, but I think it's going to be cooling off a little bit. I think just the sheer number of Raging Bolt that I'm expecting going into the tournament kind of outweighs the good matchup of Lugia, I suppose. And I also think there'll be still like enough Charizard in the room. I think Dragapult's still an awkward matchup. You're kind of getting caught in the crossfire that there's going to be all these decks playing Radiant Charizard to deal with Raging Bolt. Then it naturally is really good into Miraidon. The combination of uh, Charizard plus Iono is still like really powerful into Miraidon, even with the extra like onboard defense you can have with Tatsugiri and stuff like that. It's more than boss required to finish games in most situations. So it's not just enough to Tatsu for Gus to win the game. You sometimes also need to have like your extra attachments here and there and all this other stuff. So yeah, I think Miraidon is punished by the amount of Raging Bolt that I'm expecting in the format uh, and will sort of outweigh the strength of like having a decent time into Lugia and Gardevoir to an extent as well because I think there's just going to be so many people prepared for Iron Hands because Lugia is a threat and still lots of representation of Radzard because it's one of the best answers to Raging Bolt so yeah I think it's sort of caught in that crossfire and loses out in terms of the battle of the two more aggressive archetypes I think Bolt comes out on top a little bit more often than Maridon does. Let's start tackling some Dragapult. Uh, I do think Dragapult is the best deck in the format from all of my testing. My most played way is still Zartu, although I've played a lot more of the Pidgeot build of Dragapult as well. I still lean towards Zartu because I still feel it's really important to represent one prize board states with the amount of Bolt and Lugia I'm expecting in the format. It still feels like such a flexible archetype to me, having the combination of Radzard and then Dragapult, having the sprinkle damage counter placement, having the th threat of TM Devo, having damage mods in the form of sometimes Defiance Band, sometimes Kieran, based on how much control you're expecting, the option of Scoop Up Cyclone and Churro, again, depending on how much control you're expecting, and generally the fact that you play TM Devo, I think, helps towards your defense against Iron Hands, which is important against Lugia and Maridon. I essentially think, thanks to Tord's Masterclass, that enough people will be bringing a high caliber list of Dragapult to the tournament. I think also partially for that reason that Dragapult's going to do really, really well. The other Dragapult list that I'm going to put towards the top end is going to be Dragapult Lost Zone Box. I think this is mostly because I'm respecting so much control and because I think the Radzard fits really, really nicely into this deck list as well. You have Convey Draw and you have Dracloak Draw, so in general it's a really nice low to the ground build that can like cycle Radzard really nicely as well. So I think into the sort of high end matchups, it's going to be pretty good. There's other sort of main upsides of the Lost Zone build is you can also make some pressure plays with Cram and sort of set up Dragapult really nicely as well in that regard where you can punch things like Lugia pretty effectively, punch Raging Bolts even like tooled up and stuff. Even just initiating prize race into the other stage two decks and like make them have good hands as well. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of elements with the Lost Zone box Dragapult list. I think it's a little bit less stable than having Zatu or Pidgeot on your board. And again, you're a little bit more concerned with damage counter placement on their end. But I think gaining an extra attacking threat, having a bit more like early game presence as well uh, can be really relevant because it makes you a lot less reliant on trying to find like a turn two candy dragger in like high pressure matchups which means i am going to be putting the dragapult charizard in just the a tier i think they do complement each other actually quite well and i think there's a lot of shenanigans that these two cards combined can accomplish but I think you are just a little bit too reliant on Dracloak, which isn't a high enough impact draw engine Pokemon. All of these other ones that I'm putting in the higher tier, Lost Zone has a little bit more draw from Comfey. Dragapult either has a little bit more draw from Zatu or from having guaranteed tutor from Pidgeot. Whereas this one is fantastic when it's on all cylinders and you're candying up and Charizard's helping out thin the deck a little bit of energy, but not really so much that you can have such a nice like protected board state. Possibly if you're playing it with like Big Barrel in there as well, I could see it a little bit more, but then you're really going to be like quite tight on space in the deck list as well so maybe someone's cracked it with like enough elements of everything to come together in one deck because i do see these two attacking threats combined as like a really really dangerous combination of cards and inherently just candying into zard is one of your best protections from iron hands against lugia and maridon as well so there's genuine reason to really like this approach but i think it just falls on the consistency compared to the other two unless you're really cramming in so much engine pokemon into one deck and if that's the case you're going to really struggle against tm devo from the other dragapult builds the final deck i want to put in the the top tier is going to be Gardevoir. Gardevoir's matchup spread is just really, really well-rounded. I think it can handle the Dragapult matchups with the help of Monkey Doru, with the help of Churros and uh, Cress in there. Like, it's a lot of spaces you're committing to stabilizing that matchup, but I think it does do it quite effectively. You're inherently good into Raging Bolt Ogapon, which I, again, keep thinking is going to be one of the most popular decks in the room at NAIC, so I feel that's going to be a high weighting towards this tier list. I think you can also take on the Pidgeot controls and the Snorlax stalls quite nicely as well. Yes, I'm concerned about the amount of Iron Hand 
Hands from Lugia and Maridon. Obviously, Maridon being the more consistent, like, early presence of Iron Hands. Also, Lost Zone Box to an extent as well. But I do think TM Evo chips in with that regard, and I'm still Arvan Evo-based. I know there's a lot of people talking about Irida, Hyper Aroma. Ultimately, I think that TM Evo just gives you the most defense against Iron Hands overall, so that would still be my preference. So yeah, ultimately, it's positioning. The fact that it has a robust draw engine can represent single prize boards. All of these point towards it being a really high-tier deck for me. Next up, we're going to have Lost Zone Box. Uh, I think it can be fairly streamlined now with Blood Moon and Ursa Luna being a fantastic late game cheap attacking cost card which is really helpful for the deck. Greninja can still be amazing pressure, Iron Hands can still be amazing pressure, those things aren't going to change. I think the sort of debate comes around are you going to play Roaring Moon plus Monkey Dory? Monkey Dory can also help out against the Dragapult matchup. The combination of this with Heal plus also switch cards in your deck list can undo a lot of Dragapult's work and obviously Roaring Moon has that big one hit code potential into a number of matchups. Or are you going to try and focus in a little bit more on having some selective D Devo plays, maybe even going up to second copy of Sableye and having some TM Devo plus Town Store in the deck list as well. I think there is some validity to that because I do think there's going to be a lot of Pult, Guardi, Charizard, these sorts of decks. And I think basically none of them are going to be playing Jirachi anymore. So we can once again see the full strength of Lost Mine. That's also pretty appealing to me personally, where you almost play like a Sablezard, but you just go Sable into Moon now and have the threat of Greninja in the list as well. I'm going to put Giratina a little bit lower than it, to be honest. I think Lost Zone Box is the better of the two. I think it's just more versatile and can surprise more people with with the like tech cards you can play whereas Giratina is slightly more rigid of a choice right now there is some intrigue around unfair stamp and obviously this also gains blood moon which is cool but I think you're still front loading too many multi prizes onto your board and I think that gets punished by Lugia and Raging Bolt just a little bit too much for my liking to be honest I feel like the Dragapult Lost Zone box does what Giratina wants to do like a little bit better overall and has a bit more inbuilt draw the Reggie Drago deck I'm also going to put into B tier this might be a little bit more of an optimistic one <laughs> because it's a bit of a risky archetype because you are terrible into Raging Vault and you're also not fantastic into Lugia and also you kind of either choose to be good into control decks or you choose not to be based on how many cards you want to commit to the deck list and I also think Reggie Drago doesn't have the highest consistency even though you have the Ogre Pony X chipping in with your e-switch shenanigans and whatnot I feel like you're still a combo deck at the core even with vessels you only have like three fire energy and whatnot and you aren't in control of your discards with your V-star power that said though it's really interesting that it has a pretty good time into Dragapult it feels like it still gets a turn to Pult attack off a lot more consistently than normal Dragapult. That kind of makes sense because the Dragapult deck has the opportunity to remain one prize throughout the majority of the game, whereas the Reggie Drago deck kind of doesn't do that. You're also turned slower than the Raging Bolt deck with the sort of upside of Reggie Drago is that at least you have Radiant Charizard to swing some prize races toward the late game. And also, of course, you get to use Dragapult EX, which is much more versatile into the evolving archetypes as well. So you are a little bit more diverse. I personally would certainly play a Shred Pokemon because I think Pidgeot and Snorlax are still big enough threats for that. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting archetype. I don't think it's the highest consistency, uh, but it does have some cool selling points. And I think if someone's cracked a list, it could be... Uh, climbing that tier list a little bit more depending on the amount of Dragapult that actually turns up at the tournament because uh, that's actually one of Drago's low-key good matchups because you basically just get to Pult first and more often. And they're going to put Snorlax towards the bottom of B. I do think Accompanying Flute is a really, really dangerous card. I think Pidgeot has like the more safe matchup spread as a controlling archetype whereas Snorlax really is just like horrible into Lugia, not great into the Lost Zone builds which I do think are quite relevant but then your matchups into some of the other unprepared stuff is just much much better. I am a little bit fearful that there's going to be Churros and Kieran's up the wazoo just because of how good Pidgeot control has been in the last couple of weeks in the back end of Temporal Forces. So it's going to be on people's radar that little bit. And obviously the flute is like a high profile good card for Snorlax. So I don't think it's necessarily the best place for this tournament, but I could be completely way off. And I think as we've seen, uh, based on the general metagame, uh, the amount of respect it's going to have for just one tournament only uh, could mean that it has an insane tournament run or just a horrific tournament run based on the general like outlook going into the event. And the last deck we're going to talk about is Dialga. I think I'm going to put it into the C tier along with Chen Pao. Again, I think its selling points are kind of diminishing a little bit. Again, you get caught in the crossfire of Raging Bolt Ogre Pond's sort of main en enemy and nemesis is going to be <laughs> Radiant Charizard, and that's also like not great for Dialga Metang at times, uh, based on like how you use your V-Star power. Uh, but also, I feel like you're not great into Dragapult because they can like prey on your engine Pokemon, which I think is a little bit dangerous. You're also not great into the controlling matchups. We've seen the control decks essentially tech for uh, Dialga like quite effectively, uh, really like petered out after its like pretty strong placement. So 
I again just think there aren't like great selling points to Dialga Matang. I think at the time it was trying to tech for like a different meta game, and I think again it sort of falls down my tier list because of it. So yeah, that's going to round out my Twilight Masquerade tier list. I'm really looking forward to seeing the Japanese tournament results and see how that will affect people's deck list decisions and also possibly make you think twice about a different list as well. Maybe we see some high profile games towards like the top eight, top four, or finals and whatnot, and it changes perspectives on certain archetypes. But yeah, I think this is my general. Um, map of what I think. Uh, I don't always put an S tier, but I felt I wanted to talk about so many decks today that I wanted to put them like that. If you want to just call this A tier and like the best six decks in the game, that's fine. Um, don't really take too much attention to the letters themselves, but that's really what I think the top decks of the game are. Myself and Jack are going to give a full top 10 breakdown with all the like matchup data uh, from Trainer Hill in there. Uh, this is the website I'm on right now, just for the tier list, by the way, if you're wondering. And it's also going to have yeah, our actual 60s. I'm still playtesting a little bit of this format before I lo like lock in the 60s that I'm most happy with. Let me know your thoughts down below uh, of what you're thinking of playing for the NAIC, what you think of the tier list overall, what am I misrepresenting, what do I think is overhyped and underrepresented. I'll hear it all down below. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you tomorrow for another video. Cheers.